This is Dr. John Walton in his teaching on the book of Job. This is session number 20, Elihu's Discourse, Job chapters 32 through 37. Now we arrive at the newcomer, Elihu. He's been viewed as an interloper by interpreters of the book, someone who rather roughly fits in, if at all, into the flow of the book. But I have a different view of that. Certainly he can be viewed as an interloper, but I believe that his role is very significant in the book and plays uh, an important part uh, as a contribution to the book's logic. Even his name is interesting. Uh, the other friends' names uh, don't really feel like Hebrew names, uh, but Elihu clearly is, and it's meaningful. He is my God. Remember when we talked about the triangle, we said Elihu builds his fort in God's corner, and he's defending God. And so in that sense, Elihu is really doing the theodicy job, defending God's justice. As I've mentioned before, Elihu is more right than any other human speaker in the book, but he's still not right. Um, He's still not on target for how the book wants us to think in the end. Um, He presents himself as a youngster, in a sense, someone who has been respecting uh, his uh, wise, sage-like peers by just keeping silent and observing. Uh, But now he's become so full of of words to speak that he can't hold them back. And so let's take a look at the the role of Elihu's discourse in 32 through 37. Elihu is the only one in the book who offers a specific accusation pertaining to a specific breach in Job's righteous facade. So, where the friends can only suggest things that Job may have done wrong. Um, And Job, of course, has made an oath of his innocence in the previous chapter. Elihu has has a specific accusation to make, and it pertains to Job's self-righteousness. By the way, before we go too far into this, we should note that after Job's oath of innocence, we... The suspense is hanging in the air. Job has thrown the gauntlet out toward God to make this oath of innocence. And um, so the the confrontation with God is drawing to to a very sharp conflict. And we're there hanging on the edge of suspense. And the narrator introduces another character. It's really an intriguing kind of strategy in the book that while we're holding our breath practically, seeing how Yahweh will respond, we get the rambling speeches of Elihu. It's like, what is going on? Is this a commercial? What's, what's happening? It seems disruptive. And again, some have felt that it actually is disruptive. But I think this is all part of the strategy of the compiler of the book. He's going to let you stew a little bit on whether God is going to respond to Job or not. And so in the meantime, Elihu has his say. Elihu's role in the second part of the book parallels in some ways the role of the challenger in the first part of the book because he proposes an alternate way to view Job's righteousness. The challenger suggested that Job's righteousness could be viewed as simply a search for benefits. For prosperity. Elihu is not going to go that direction. He's going to suggest that the alternate way to view Job's righteousness is as self-righteousness. The challenger questioned Job's motives. Elihu actually questions Job's righteousness. He's the only one in the book that does so, including God. Even while Elihu defends God from the charge of evil, and you can find that several times in chapter 34, um, and he defends God's justice in 36.3 and 37.23, yet he accepts 
the rough paradigm of the retribution principle. That's chapter 34, 11, and 36, 11, and 12. So, God is not charged with evil. God is viewed as carrying out justice. Yet the retribution principle is true. Now, remember, we talked about how Elihu did that when we talked about the triangle. He redefines the retribution principle, not just being remedial for things done in the past, but being preventive to anticipate things that are, are coming up. He agrees with the challenger about Job's motives. That's in 35.3. And his major point is that he accuses Job of the sin of self-righteousness. And he considers that sin to be the reason for Job's suffering. You can find that in 34, verses 35 to 37. His contention is that Job's self-righteous defense of himself is serious enough to justify punitive action against him. The Elihu variation is that judgment may precede offense, since it can have the purpose of drawing out offensive behavior. So in that sense, it's almost like the suffering of Job would be baiting him uh, in order to reveal what really is going on behind the scenes. The suffering was necessary in order to reveal the problem. Elihu's emphasis is on righteousness, not on the great symbiosis, though he questions whether God needs human righteousness. Maybe that's not even that important. He's patently right in his condemnation of Job's self-righteous attitude. We can see that in Job's speeches and in Job's willingness to defend himself at the expense of God. That is, that is a legitimate critique of Job and his thinking. And Elihu brings those things out. But Elihu is wrong about Job's motivations. Elihu despises the great symbiosis attitude and believes that Job is still harboring a desire for benefits. Job has amply demonstrated that prosperity at any cost is not the driving motivation of his life. And so in that way, Elihu is wrong about Job. Elihu is right about God when he insists that God is not accountable to us and that his justice, along with all other aspects of his character, is unassailable. We can't question God. We can't do a better job than God. We dare not impugn his governance. God is not contingent, and we should not think that his actions are subject to our evaluation or correction. In these things, Elihu is right. And again, he gives a, a very um, appropriately elevated view of God. At the same time, he's wrong about the nature of God's policies. He continues to have an inadequate theodicy, and he is attempting theodicy. He does not seem to realize that in attempting theodicy, he is falling prey to the same fault of which he accuses Job. That is, Elihu is overestimating his ability to bring coherence on the basis of justice. Elihu is still working the triangle. He tries to reshape it to his use, but he's still working the triangle. He still thinks justice is the foundation of the system. He's still engaged in theodicy. He still thinks coherence comes from justice. And he still thinks that he can work out a simple equation. It's a little more complex equation than Job and his friends were using because it redefines the retribution principle but it still expresses the idea that a simple justice equation can bring coherence. On that, he's wrong. And it's going to take Yahweh's speeches to adjust our perspective on these things. Mm-hmm. 
This is Dr. John Walton in his teaching on the book of Job. This is session number 20, Elihu's Discourse, Job chapters 32 through 37. Mm-hmm. 